Keith Wood, very welcome. You're an old hand at these. Justin Marshall, very welcome to Off the Ball. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, to whoever managed to finally catch one of my passes, which is very unlike, uh, unlikely to be waist above. Um, that's like win, winning the lottery, actually. It's a New Zealand All Black ball with my signature on it, so consider yourself very lucky. Oh, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Keith Wood, we just played a video there. Paul's just thinking, I wanted that. <laughs> I think you were the last man to try and get a hand on him there. I am. Um, I don't like that video. That mm. was pretty. Um, what a pants effort at a tackle. Yeah. You went for the handshake. I did. He was outside my sphere of influence. It was uh, all or nothing, and it was nothing. We've been um, we've been very unfair to you because, as you'll see here, somebody did score two tries that day against the All Blacks. Take a look. Oh yeah. Wood. The All Blacks probably won't contest. They didn't. Well taken by O'Kelly, but the All Blacks are well organised in defence. If they can hold it, goal line is just there. It's still held up. There's a chance and there's a try. Mertens, Duramir, or solid tackling by the little guy Mark McCall, who has a reputation as being a very good tackler. That's a little play now. McGinnis brings it out. Away for Hickey. Nolan is in on the inside. Now Hickey on Marshall. Marshall chases and makes the tackle. A try saving tackle. Now it's snapped up by That's Dawson. Kieran Dawson. Ireland hit the ruck hard. They've got a good line out here, but the kick is made. Keith Wood is leading the charge. And Wood gets it. Two tries to Keith Wood. I'll take that one. That's for certain. Yeah. <laughs> Now, un unfortunately, they beat us by a record score that game. <laughs> 63... 15. 50, I, was was gonna say, I was going to say 17. I was giving us an extra two points. 63, 15. Yeah. We, we took well, that record off you a few years later. Don't worry oh, about thank it. Thank God for that record. <laughs> <laughs> 1997 in Dublin. 97 in Dublin. You took yeah. that record off. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he took it. Uh, the, the start of that game, my... My hero was playing, um, or was there, Sean Fitzpatrick, and he was the guy that changed hooker, and uh, he got injured a couple of weeks beforehand and didn't, um, So, which meant that was your first game as captain, yeah, if that's right. And I went on to, Fitzy was there in his suit beforehand, and I just said, you gutless coward, I can't believe you chickened out. <laughs> uh, he didn't speak to me for about 10 years afterwards. You know, uh, can't, New Zealanders can't take a joke, can no, you? No, we can't. No. <laughs> Um, you were quite young to be captain. You'd only been in the setup maybe two years at that stage. Yeah, I was. I was um, very lucky to be All Black captain for that day. Uh, but as Woody mentioned, Fitzy was struggling with a knee injury that he never actually o uh, overcame. It mm. ended his career pretty much. And uh, I was sort of a caretaker captain. There was some plenty of experienced players within the team, the likes of Zin Zanbrook and um, you know Walter, Walter Little, Frank Bunts. We had some real talent in there. So why they chose me, I have no idea. But um, it was, uh, it was an amazing opportunity, as these gentlemen all know, to captain your country. So uh, I've got that there. That's all I had, though. <laughs> um, my my uh, disagreements with referees probably cost me captaining more tests. Yes, they used to annoy me. Did still you do. still How many did you do? I did uh, four tests. Four tests. Yeah. yeah. We played at some unusual venues that year. So we, that, that was, the, I think, the last time at Lansdowne Road that the All Blacks played there. Uh, before the stadium changed, and then Cardiff Arms was out of action, so uh, we played at Wembley in London against Wales, and then we played two tests against England, and one was at Old Trafford, and then the second one at Twickenham, so some unusual venues that year. How did you guys view Ireland games at the, at, during that stage of your career? Well, that was my first experience, and I didn't like it very much after 20 minutes, um, because I, I guess the old Lansdowne Road, as I was to soon experience, I'd never been there before, uh, the crowd were right on you, they were right there, and the atmosphere was absolutely incredible. It really was. That stadium had some amazing history, and Ireland came out of the, the gates big time, and all of a sudden, as an All Black captain, I was staring down um, you know, points early on, and Ireland were really up for it, the crowd were right behind them. So uh, it was an amazing experience, um, but we always expected that when we played Ireland, that uh, there's always passion, there's always intent, Mm. Uh, and to a degree, we didn't want to absorb it. Uh, we had to sort of match it, um, but that particular day, we didn't for a while. So that, that's always been the same, all my experiences in playing Ireland, just incredible passion 
and uh, real energy to, to beat the All Blacks. Mm. And that was one of the Brian Ashton's first games, I think, and um, we had six new caps to play against New Zealand, which is not ever a good thing. And I remember going out beforehand, um, I'd been captain for about a year, and we built ourselves up into a level of pure, unadulterated frenzy. I mean, it was, we kicked the crap out of you for 20 minutes, and that was about the full extent of where we got. I got smashed. Um, Zinni and, and Andrew Blowers absolutely did me in, so I tore my ankle ligaments, was gone at half time, and, um, and you just went ballistic afterwards. And it was it. I mean, I hate when I look back that long because we weren't at the races at all. And so that's a lovely thing to say about us that you'd always have, a, you know, you'd go for the passion and stuff. And we hated that. That was just so upsetting. And we wanted to get there, yes, have the passion, but still be there at 80 minutes. And that didn't happen for a long time. We were very close in a game down in... in um, Dunedin. In, in Dunedin. And we were very close the year before, actually, in... in um, in Lansdowne, we were kind of close and close, but just not good enough. And it took an awful long time. Sure, it only took to a couple of years ago before that was gone. But that idea that either very good, they're going to bring a lot of passion, was the biggest insult you could ever possibly say to it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, now that I think about this, I, and I'm only doing it now because um, we're live, so, and you're sitting there, and... <laughs> Obviously, if you got upset, there's not a great deal you could do about it now, so I've not mentioned to this personally to you, but um, being a captain, I was a nervous captain as well. Yes, we had a good day at the office, but I was also terrible at doing after-match speeches, and I don't know whether you'll like this or not, but I called you Nick Popplewell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I if you recall it. Like it. No, I don't know if you no, recall it at no, the time. Just... And, uh, yeah, I said, yeah, the Irish captain, Nick Popplewell, thanks very much. And, and then, you're, then you appeared, and I thought, well, they looked similar, so... <laughs> Not really. No. No, that's just the regard we were held. I will, I will say that, <laughs> that our table that day was myself, yourself, Fitzy, Zinni, yes. a few bottles of champagne. Um, we were all sloshed by the time we got up to make those <laughs> aftermath speeches. It was, yeah, that was good. Thanks very much, though. I you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> You're not coming to Kittaloo for the next few days, I can tell you that. But speaking of slosh, so I was absolutely outstanding that uh, um, Quinny could sit here with three open bottles of Heineken and not touch them for, <laughs> for 40 minutes. He must be out the back sucking his thumb now. <laughs> it's been absolutely torture for him. <laughs> if we could hit in a few points in your career, and we'll talk about Ireland, New Zealand, and the Lions tour as well. Mm. And I saw a very interesting quote from you where you said, and you had this, this brilliant career with the Crusaders as well, over 100 appearances and five Super Rugby Championships, but you said, um, rugby saved my life. And you were talking about your late teenage years, and I thought that was a very interesting comment. In what way were you going? You were going down a bad path, it seems? Yeah, I, I think I was. Um, and rugby can change the way that you think about life, I, I guess, because it enters new um, areas that you don't think about into your game, uh, into your life, like discipline and... Uh, you know, teammates, people relying on you. Um, yeah, early early in, my, in my youth, uh, it was a bit like I was from Limerick. Um, <laughs> a, bit a bit wild and ready. Uh, well, no, hang on, I'm sorry a second. You're an All-Ireland Hurley <laughs> champion. <laughs> <laughs> I get, I get the feeling you're going to hurl me into the second row shortly. Here's me throwing balls around. Um, but yeah, so look, I was going down a, a little bit of an unsavoury path, and that was, I guess, due to maybe a little bit of um, boredom to a degree, and I was around the wrong people. Uh, but the problem was that it was creeping into my rugby in the earlier days, and uh, I, I, was, I wasn't a, a player that went through any of the age grade systems. I didn't play schools rugby. I didn't. I represent New Zealand until um, the under 19. So generally, in the system up until that stage, I wasn't um, highly involved in it until right. I made Southland. At, as I think I was an 18-year-old. So that, that needed to uh, things needed to change. And then I had a, a pretty awful incident um, that uh, let's just say it involved involved with the police, and um, it, it really shocked me. Mm. And it also made me realise that rugby doesn't accept that. Uh, and in short, and not to breach your privacy, but you've spoken about it before, you potentially were looking at trouble or even jail time where there was an, yes. an incident. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, because of that, uh, you know, 
you had, I had to take gauge of where I wanted to go and what direction I wanted to go, and, and uh, I chose rugby uh, over that. And uh, I think it, yeah, again, I think it changed my life and changed the way I thought about life, and I've got rugby to thank. It wasn't at, uh, at that stage pro. I wasn't going to um, make any money out of it. Professionalism wasn't even being mentioned, but I loved the game, mm. and I wasn't respecting it. And I decided that I wanted to play the game, and I wanted to try and be in an All Black, and... That's the way, that's the path I chose. You became one of 22 in France. What's your memory of that day? Uh, great memories of it. Uh, we had a terrible test, uh, the first test in Marseille. Uh, the French beat us. I wasn't playing, I wasn't involved. There's only a midweek team. And then I was picked as a bolter in the second test. But it's kind of infamous in New Zealand folklore because it involved, our manager at the time was the late, great uh, Colin Meads. And uh, he was incredibly unhappy with the attitude that the team had throughout the week, the attitude that the team had when they played uh, in Marseille, and he gave one of the most brutal um, speeches on a Monday morning to uh, senior All Blacks, to the coach, Lockheed Haynes at the time, uh, that what we were doing wasn't what the All Black jersey was about. And when he delivered that message, he did not hold back, and I can't... Uh, regale you with the superlatives that came out of his mouth, but I, I bet you can guess. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, so he wasn't part of the ticket in any way, he was just there as he, Colin Meads, a legend. No, he was there, he was the manager. He was the manager, okay, mm. so he came in and... So the yeah. manager usually just yeah. has to deal with real complicated things like organising the bus. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, he, this was something that he just decided to... Have been missed and... Yes, yes, <laughs> so hard to do. <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah, he, he delivered a speech that resulted in, and I'm not afraid to say it, I've never seen as much blood, uh, as much intent at training all week. And there was an attitude shift big time. A lot of players, even, um, again, the late, uh, great John Alomu was guilty of it. Uh, and I had the privilege of playing behind a forward pack and in a team that were just next level, mm. and it made my debut very enjoyable and very easy. Yeah, it must be a surreal thing, you became All Blacks number 948, to actually be in the dressing room, all these legends around you, and you're kind of putting on this jersey, like, it is still the most famous jersey in rugby, and maybe one of the most in sport. Yeah, I was just a kid, uh, I guess, and, and again, I got picked from nowhere, it was, uh, a bit of a, it was a bit of a bolter for the squad as it was, let alone be picked for a test match in the last, and most important test match that the All Blacks were going to play that year because we'd lost the one the previous week and it was Laurie Maines' last test as All Black coach. A few legends were rumoured to not be uh, you know, continuing their careers, so it was a big moment. Mm. Um, and I remember sitting in the changing room and, and looking at that jersey and thinking about being an All Black and whether or not I was man enough to put it on and not let down my family, my friends and all the people back home who would be sitting back and watching. Um, and then all I had to do was glance around the room and look at the faces that were looking back at me, and it gave me courage, because uh, the, root, the, the faces in that room were full of people that I'd sat back and admired being All Blacks, and all of a sudden I was going to be a teammate of theirs playing a test match, mm. and that made it a lot easier. Yeah, no doubt. We always talk about the hacker from our vantage point, invariably, and obviously the players we talk to tend to be the ones looking at it. Mm. Tell, talk to us about being in it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's unique. No doubt about it, but we are very well aware that when we're, um, when we're all blacks and you get brought into the side for the first time that you respect it, uh, that you know it, and, and you don't take it for granted. And everyone's taken uh, into haka practice, which doesn't involve any coaches or support staff, it's just the players and the, and the kamatoa, they call them, which is the leader of the halfback, uh, leader of the haka, and that gets everybody together. Um, so that everybody knows what it's about, how to do the actions, how to do the words, and how to do it with passion. Uh, and, and that's a big part of making sure that it, it gets the respect that it's due, that you do it properly. Yeah. Uh, the but biggest mistake I ever made was, without shadow of a doubt, I wasn't great at it. Look at me, I'm not that, not that fearsome. Um, <laughs> and so I, I used to try and sort of position myself in areas where I wouldn't be seen, because obviously the opposition, uh, their focus is, our, our focus is meet someone's gaze. And so when you're doing it, look at them. If you can find your opponent, brilliant. If you can't, in the spur of the moment, just find someone else. And there are certain people to, to avoid looking at. Um, <laughs> especially when you're not good at the haka. Just don't look at a big, big person. That's a bad idea. So I, I thought the best thing that I could do was go and stand next to the most useless person that could do the haka, and that was Andrew Mertens. Um, 
So I went and stood by him, but that was the biggest mistake I could make because he was like 22 eyes staring straight at him, so I was in the vicinity. <laughs> so it wasn't as if I was avoiding it, I was right in, right in the mix. So you don't get, you're not told where to stand. So that triangle formation, lads go and make their way into their own positions. Yeah. Because for that exact reason, for the first few, it's, it's probably intimidating and, and you enjoy it because you want to understand what it's all about. And then you don't tire of it, but you get used to it and it became, becomes less of an event. And then you try and find a way to react to it. And you know, what happened in 05, we were told by a Mary Elder to, you know, to act in a particular way. But what I did decide to do was find the skinniest, <laughs> least, least Maori looking individual on the team, which was Ben Smith for large portions, because they tend to be the guys that are least into it and they're hidden back in the back right or back left. So try and eyeball them, and they, you could just sense from their intent that it's like, let's, just get, let's, let's just get this done. Yeah, yeah. What's Were you a part sorry, of the group? Sorry, wasn't, didn't you nearly stop doing it around the mid 2000s, or you were talking about? Who were you doing it for and why were you doing it? Yeah, Gilbert well, Anoka speaks about it and that's when it really became powerful because the players kind of took it back. Or brought, brought back into it and, and yeah, you're absolutely right. We, we went through a period because the, the haka actually only used to be performed overseas. And then we felt that with the way that it was going, it was getting quite theatrical uh, and also it, it was regular. Um, and it was getting overused, we thought, because it needed to be special. It needed to be uh, you know, done in the right manner, but needed to, I guess, have the right meaning. And we felt that it was losing a bit of that because all of a sudden we're doing it for every test match in New Zealand, every test match away. And with the calendar the way it is now, you know, that's 13 or 14 test matches a year. So, uh, but it's also around the time that we, we spoke about um, you know, bringing out the new haka, haka Kapaponga, uh, who was, interestingly enough, the haka that we um, decided not to do, and I was in the leadership group at the time, um, we'd practiced it, we'd started learning it, and the time that we were going to bring it out was for the British and Irish Lions series in 2005. So we decided that we wanted to have this second haka with kamati to be able to sort of dissipate a little bit of that regularity of kamati. Um, but be, me being in the leadership group at the time, so one of the senior players, uh, I was very for not doing it in the Lions series because I couldn't do the actions properly. So. <laughs> Incredibly selfishly, I said, this is not a good idea. Um, but I also had background in it, which was, you know, we don't get the Lions very often. Lots of players don't get to play against them. And if things didn't go well in the first test match and we brought a new hacker out in New Zealand, New Zealand people would look at it and think, what were they doing? And it wouldn't have a great effect. So they ended up doing it after I left, which was the right time because I wouldn't have done it justice. How do, how do you square that for how important it is to then doing an ad for Adidas in relation to the hacker? <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have mentioned that I thought he was Nick Popper. Well, <laughs> that's one of the hardest questions I've ever been asked before in my life. We'll answer it, so will you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually did the advert for Adidas. Um, you sold your soul for I, Adidas. <laughs> well, it was all part of sponsorship because Adidas had taken over the sponsorship of the All Blacks, so we were we were asked to do an ad for the Haka. Yeah, look, I I get that, and and I do get that. I've mentioned that there's a bit of theatre in it nowadays, but the, the theatre in it is more the fact that you know the microphones come on and you can hear it reverberating around the stadium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Look. If I ever want to go and say anything about it, it's part of us and it's what we do. What I think is a real shame, I was also involved in the Haka in 1997 uh, at uh, Old Trafford and I was captain where Norm Hewitt and Richard Cockrell basically were headbutting each other. Uh, and that's when they decided that enough was enough and they separated the teams and put them you know, that far apart that I thought it, it takes away from the opposition being able to re react any way they want to. I think that's got to be, um, there's got to be some more rope given there. I like the fact that the teams are now advancing, they're coming up, they're meeting the haka, they're responding in any way they want. I think that's, it doesn't, um, I don't think disrespect the haka, that uh, appreciates it. And it also says, yep, we're here, we're up for the challenge. And I think, so for all of that theatre that the All Blacks have, I think the, the opposition should get that um, opportunity to um, confront it in any way they want. Mm. There's a, a tweet in, by the way, well, somebody asking, well, I thought that was a round of applause. Somebody asking, uh, so 24 tries in 81 matches is a fairly impressive record. Was that 
Oh, was it part of your game? Did, is there any particular reason you were so good at sniffing out a try? Very greedy, probably, yeah, more okay. than anything. Um, no, I don't think so. Some players have the knack of being in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, so... Uh, I think they were, you were doing... They were doing the kind of up, upfield support lines before everyone, anyone else was. So you yeah. probably plenty of guys, Bunce and Little and Jonah Lomo. That's right. Uh, even that first try we showed there, Jonah. you're off someone's shoulder. Yeah. Because I remember when Dougie first came over, you know, uh, you'd be running across the pitch this way, Dougie would be running that way, and you'd clatter into him. You know, yeah. he'd, be, he'd be seeing what's going to happen next, and he'd be on his way to where the ball is going to be. Um, and uh, you know we were we we were going around getting set for the next rock or whatever. Whereas a lot of the Kiwis, it's real upfield support lines. And uh, Dougie was very interesting talking about that when he first came into Munster. That day, the coach in Auckland, mm. they used to sit behind them, sit behind the back tree. And if they weren't getting on their bike every every time, it looked like there might be a half break. He was on top of them, and uh, it's a real Kiwi thing. Isn't it? A lot of Kiwi nines score a lot of tries. It's a, yeah, you're, it's, it's having a positive mindset that you're not thinking negatively by going lateral. You're, you're mm. expecting your teammates to make gain lines, so your movement's forward and mm. you anticipate line breaks, you anticipate offloads, and yeah, the, 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 the mantra is to, to flood through that way, yeah. and halfbacks can do that, and you see them doing it much better now. Like, almost to the point, some of them, the real good ones that run in those support lines are in front of the ball carrier. Yeah. So they've basically taken a shortcut from the ruck and the line breaks out here and they're ahead. Yeah. And they have to sort of try and pull back and time themselves yeah. to get the pass. Yeah. Somebody else says, great to hear from Luke Glad's a stylish man on and off the pitch. Wasn't afraid to reach for the peroxide either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got a few nice shots you here in your heyday looking no shame in very that. stylish. Wow. Look at that. That is beautiful. In fairness, you're pulling that off. Oh, that's, that's not bad. Yeah, I don't know. See, these things can be much, much worse and go very wrong, trust us. <laughs> <laughs> there is... <laughs> come on, come on, next one. There really. is no next one, there is no next one. That's, that's, that's where we're going. There's still a few tips in there, though, Marcy, are there? No, yes, there are. <laughs> yeah, uh, look, that, that one of yours, which yeah. uh, the first one, which yeah. is entertaining as the crowd responded, um, I went through the same stage. It's called the Meg Ryan stage. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's you not. Don't, you it's, don't have to show it again. It's, it's okay, not one. Fo it. It's not one finally to go back on. I'm um, thank God that, you didn't find it in photos of me because I went through a stage like that, and they called me Meg Ryan in the press as well. That photo is from around the time that we had Mike McGurn's wedding. <laughs> and, uh, I remember Brian was sitting about five seats ahead of me and uh, Reggie Corrigan came in and uh, he saw Brian from behind and he goes to me, he goes, Jesus, Paul Wallace is after putting that a bit away. <laughs> <laughs> It was actually that, it was that wedding. I, I, I was at it with, uh, with my now wife, and there was pictures outside the church um, beforehand because McGurn's a bit of a local celebrity in, Ellis, in Enniskillen and um, knew some of the rugby lads were going to be there. So anyway, front of, the, um, of one of the red tops the next day, the male, uh, the male or, the, or the son, there's a picture of the two of us holding hands, and um, she looks at it and she goes, oh my God. God, that is disgraceful. I was like, you are not wrong, that's disgraceful. That is absolutely appalling. I said, that's got to change. She goes, Jesus, fair play to him. He's really weighing in behind me on this one. I'm pretty appreciative. So she, she goes, what, what are we going to do about it? I said, well, I am going to start by dieting on Monday. She goes, what, what do you mean? There's a massive big circle blown up and a blow up of her pants showing in the picture. And I haven't seen that at all. All I've seen is the size of my head. <laughs> <laughs> complete, complete cross wires. But yeah, it was. It was. It was. I was appalled at myself. Yeah, that's a professional athlete there. On a serious, <laughs> on a semi-serious note, were you getting bad advice, like being told to eat the wrong things, or were you actually just not as disciplined as you became? Um, Definitely bad I'd, advice. I'd, I'd, I'd like. To, yeah, I'd like to be able to blame bad advice. I suppose I was getting away with it and I probably 
didn't really understand what professionalism was about because I was able to burn the candle at both ends and still, sur and still survive. I, I think, didn't you play against Wales with that haircut? Yeah. You, scored two, you scored two incredible tries. Do you remember mm. that game? Yeah. You'd just come back from a hamstring injury mm. and you were you, like, you obviously had a bit of fat in your body, but you were actually in great shape when you came back for that game, do you, do you remember? Was, like I was still, I still, I probably wasn't known for my engine, but I could, I could keep powerful. it going, yeah. yeah. So, and I had myself convinced that that was the weight that I needed to actually get through, accelerate through when, it, when, when impacts came. So, um, finally someone got hold of me before it was too late. <laughs> I'm just th so thrilled at how long we've had it up on the screen, I think that's the <laughs> best part. Because don't worry, Keith Wood, we dug into the archives. We had to get some hair there. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is where you attempt Brill, Brill Cream length, I think. You should have... <laughs> You're thinking about it there. I have a great photo of Woody playing soccer under 13s for Wembley Rovers. Yes, yes. I'm glad full you've got photos of, of me, Paul. Um, full head of hair. Full head of hair. I'm 22 there. Look at that, for God's sake. That's fantastic. <laughs> Paul, would, you, would you go for the plugs now, if you could have it back? Not a chance. No. You should look, every day of my life was a bad hair day, for <laughs> Christ's sake. <laughs> um, Mr. Paul O'Connell, come on in. Ah, that's fantastic. Give me a break. <laughs> the next one's actually a brilliant picture. It's in your book. Oh, yeah. The fiery red hair. Your monsters, yep. Yeah. A full head of hair in that one you cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> So, I'm going to rudely uh, surmise different parts of your career. Two World Cups in 99 and 03, and for different reasons, we're looking on at semi-final stage. In 03, injured and broken ribs at half-time, and you got player, you were in the team of the tournaments, so you had a very good tournament, but they're the, the fine margins. Mm. If I could skip ahead to the Lions Tour of 05, seeing as everybody, you know, the guys here were there, um, you've obviously been hanging out with Tana Umaga, people have seen over the last few days. Up until this week, I mean, you talked about, he was talking about going for dinner the other night and stuff. Has it just been like very quick, hello, hello, hello things? Have you had a big conversation before this week? No, not a big conversation. We've seen each other at different events and then down in New Zealand and I bumped into one another a couple of times. I saw him in Toulon, but to have an opportunity to actually sit down and have a conversation and talk about it a bit and, you know, a little bit of getting the elephant, you know, talk about the elephant in the room and almost joking about it and getting on with it. So I, I think it was good from, from a bit from our perspective because we never had that proper opportunity, but also from a public perspective to one, once and for all park it and, yeah. and move on. And, and people still won't, you know, there'll be people that will always have that, you know, had it a little bit when the pictures came out today on social media, but that's the reality. Some people don't let things go. I've parked it, and, um, and we had a good laugh on, on Wednesday night last, last week, um, and then obviously all the, the, um, the media that we did together on, on Friday. Is it the kind of thing where the conversation entails him saying, do you know what, I am actually very sorry, or had he done that already? Probably it was done in a way back in 05 and then it never really materialized after that but there was definitely more there was a, a more impactful version of that this time round um not that i was looking for it but i suppose it was, it's still nice to hear it was more about the way he behaved around it i think the the tackle itself you know was one of those things and you can argue it to the hilt as to you know the legalities or otherwise you know these days, the law is very different than then, but sure. even then, you know, the feeling was that it was a, it was a bad tackle. But, but anyway, it was, it was more so the aftermath and the reaction to it. And, um, As in, he called you a crybaby in his book? Yeah. We didn't talk about that on, on Wednesday. Okay. <laughs> you know, so you are over it, you are? <laughs> I, no, yeah, I'm, I'm good, why? Yeah, no, not? I am, fine, it's all right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> The New Zealand perspective, so it unfolded, it happened, it was a terrible thing, and then the PR machine and the lines kicked into gear and Alistair Campbell was there and, a, you know, there was the point made, this is very serious. What was the atmosphere like in your camp? Did you, did you think these, are, these guys are being quote-unquote crybabies or did you think we actually have crossed a line here? Oh, no, I think the, oh, the whole incident um, was always going to warrant debate, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, and as Drico said, uh, when you technically look at it, um, I've, I've always maintained that the All Blacks don't have in, any intent to, to go out and wrongfully harm somebody. Um, and, and 
Um, <laughs> illegally. Um, and you know, I think probably the biggest, the biggest disappointment year was that it became, it became really ugly. Uh, and, and because of that, it, 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 sh it, sh it shut us off, I guess, and it shut both teams off um, in, that, in that regard. Um, and, you know, these, these, the biggest disappointment from, for me was, as a player was I wanted to play a British, Irish, British and Irish Lions series, and I wanted to play it against the best team that the British and Irish Lions could put, to, put together. And unfortunately, we had one of the, the greatest centres the world's ever seen out of the, out of the, out of the mix. And, and for me, that, that put a bit of a dampener on the series because, you know, you, you want to test yourself against the best and that wasn't going to be the case anymore. Um, so that, that was a real shame for the series. Um, and, and I felt for Dricko. I actually went up to him. Um, he probably won't remember. I remember it well. Yeah, when, when he was getting stretched off and, and, and just gave him a pat on the leg and said, hope you're OK. Um, because, you know, it, it was a real shame uh, that, 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 that that happened. But, yeah, the aftermath of it was, I think he's... He summed it up really well, that it, it, it got really ugly and, and the media all blew it up and then the, then the tension started. Uh, but Paul, it didn't deter from the series, I don't think. But, Paul, um, Paul, did you want to come in there? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. We probably didn't handle it great, did we, by doing a midnight press conference about it. Was it midnight or what time was it? I see you looking at me. Uh, um. I don't know, was there, was there, was there, was there was some kind of a yeah. press conference Listen, about yeah, it, it, was with, a power, it with video it footage, was a we, we just, thing. you know, I, I, I think that, that probably wasn't a good idea really. Not to put you through all this again, did you know all that, you're probably more worried about your health obviously, did you know that the PowerPoint stuff was going on and Alistair Campbell and all that was kicking into gear, did you think that was a good, bad idea? No, I think, I think the issue was that there was no camera angles that were, that would, could properly clarify it and that only came retrospectively and people have a hazy memory as to how it unfolded because I came back from holidays and I found in my cubbyhole in Leinster where you get you know some mail and stuff that I found a VHS that someone that had taken on a handy cam that right. was actually the angle that subsequently everyone thinks that they saw immediately after the, after, or after okay. the game or during, during you know in the, in the weeks you know, or, and days afterwards where that's actually not the case this actually came three months later right so the angle so it, we all yeah, see so it all, okay. so it all went on and on and you could kind of maybe see something and then that angle came out and then, yeah. yeah. But a, a lot of the rubbish of that was that it never was deemed worthy of a sighting. The sighting commissioner went back to South Africa and said no, there's no need and it was gone. So there was never an opportunity to air it properly. So instead it became spin doctors on both sides airing it and giving their view on it. And that was, like that wouldn't happen now for a variety of different reasons. Um, but it was, uh, it was a bit of a shock it was, you know, to see something like that happen on the expectation that was going for that Lions tour, for how big that was, for this being a very good team, to suddenly seeing it. It did take a bit of the glass off the Lions. It, it was a real pity because I was quite friendly with Tana before that. We'd done, you know, we'd played against a number of time, uh, one another a number of times and I think we probably hit it off and because I think there was a mutual respect there from a playing perspective and it was a bit of a shame because we got to pick up on Wednesday and genuinely have a good laugh again. He's a, he's, he's a good man, he is, he's a good lad and he's good crack to be around. So it's a real shame that there was that 13 year period in between that you kind of missed yeah. out on probably having someone that you would associate and see after games and automatically go to in the opposition and, and chat to. So, I suppose that is one upside from yeah. having, having the get-together last week, for sure. In terms of, so even uh, post-Keith and Justin's era, Ireland-New Zealand games, never massively happy hunting grounds for either of you two. Any strong memories, good or bad, that sums up the period? Well, I, I, I still find it a little bit um, sickening watching some footage of them off the back of 2013. It's the one, when I go back to, to one game that to, to relive in your career would probably be that one. Mm. Um, just because I wanted to beat them once and we had it there and, and it was agonizing being off the park for 25 minutes after picking up a concussion. I suppose if, you went, if I wanted to go back and, tr and try and do something differently, I wouldn't try and hit Brody Retallick as hard as I, I thought I, I could. <laughs> and I thought I caught him 
off guard before he saw me coming and you know clever players see the game earlier and he did see it earlier and he braced himself and he won that collision and there was and there was there'd been an incident the previous six nations where i'd gone back on against france with concussion there's no doubt i, I was helped off the field and somehow managed to make my way back on it because other players were being treated so when the doctor aina falvi saw this he, I think he was extra cautious. I'm not saying that he wasn't right, but he said he saw me spit my gum shield out after the incident, which I did do. And he got me off for HIA, and I knew when I was going off for the HIA that he wasn't going to let me on. I knew it was just a case of me, him getting me off the pitch, yeah. which was sort of sickening because I went in and passed my HIA, but he wasn't having any of it. So to sit that for those 25 minutes, I went between the dressing room and back out you know, when we got super close at the end on the touchline and then that agony of the last three minutes. Because you feel as though, I remember very, very clearly, we were playing a bit negatively, we were picking and jamming, and you, the thing you know, when you're trying to wind down the clock is even just go to the 10 for a switch play, one every three or four phase, you just have to show some form of positivity. And what annoys me being on the sideline is if I was at 12 or 13, I'd have demand, demanded Johnny call the ball and that we would have done that mm -hmm. and maybe things might have been different. So you look back and there's very few regrets you have in your career, but I, you know, that is one that does still pain me a little bit. Yeah. Do you want to give us an old black thought or memory from your time that jumps out or lingers? Yeah. Um, you know, we played them in 2006 in two tests down there and uh, we, were, we played really well. Um, we were after winning. We were after winning the Heineken Cup for the first time. There's a lot of Munster players in the team. We were quite confident. You know, we kind of had a Munster pack and a Leinster backline almost. And um, we played some great rugby down there. I even remember we in the first half in Hamilton. I think we were winning 15-6, and we put the ball down into the corner, and they kicked it out. I think so. It would have been our line out five meters out, just before half time. And, uh, and the referee blew the whistle for half time, and, uh, and we let that game slip, and we let the game slip in Auckland a week later as well, playing yeah. some really good rugby. Um, and that's, I, I think they had some weaknesses definitely back then. Lino wise, yeah. New Zealand were never good lino wise, and, and scrum they could be a, a little bit dodgy as well. But since then, just their line out has just gone to a whole, well, it's probably. A good bit after that, even they're just their line out has gone to a whole new level. Their scrum is excellent, and they've very little weaknesses now. Yeah, um, which shows what, what a big credit it is that Ireland eventually did beat them. Yeah, yeah. we're going to preview that game after the interview in uh, just a second. The other, I mean, the memory of you guys touring down there all the time is just how bloody cold it looks. Frankly, it's dark. It seems like at three o'clock in the day, it's freezing cold. Does it bother you? Do you find it a bit miserable too? Which is like being here, is it not? <laughs> yeah, I suppose it is. <laughs> <laughs> we, did play... <laughs> we did play one game in Wellington, which is the coldest game I was oh. ever involved in. I remember you, you, to do, you to do media after the thing, and we were all waiting in the tunnel to, to clap it, and there was people genuinely getting pissed off over how long <laughs> it was taking you to do media, I remember. That was, well, that was the coolest game I was ever involved in. Yeah. That, that Lions game though, in 2005 in Christchurch, when it was sleeting. It was sleeting. That, your skill level was incredible. We, we, we played well that day, to be fair, like expect, but that was very cold. I, I recall actually getting a hot cup of soup when I went off with about 10 minutes to go, and it's the first time that's ever happened. And I was sitting there with my hot cup of soup, warming my hands, shivering like nothing else. It was so, so cold. And I look up to the far end of what was then the Headley stand, at the old Jade Stadium, and I reckon there was about half a dozen uh, guys, definitely from Wales, with their shirts off, dancing around. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, respect, respect. It was actually incredibly warm in the medical room that day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was just the, the, the morphine drinker. You were, like, you were, in, a, you were, in, you were on, you were in space. You were in the. Well, do, do you know that <laughs> it did? T it, it, I said this in, in my book that it took 45 minutes to get the morphine because they only had one lot of it in oh. the stadium, and some man had had a heart attack. Not my dad in the in the first um, <laughs> yes, three or four did. minutes. Yeah. Um, and so I had to wait for it to be administered because uh, yeah the the muscles had gone into spasm. So yeah. He was having a heart attack. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't think it was good news. 
Oh, Driscoll I slammed don't. heart attack. Se I selfish don't. man. <laughs> selfish man. <laughs> Demanded the morphine. <laughs> Um, oh, there was one last thing I wanted to touch on. I know I'm going to kill it for going later. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. You mentioned him a few times. John Olomu. Mm. Must have been just phenomenal to be around that guy. Look, uh, yeah. Um, I, I just think, the, and, and I think everybody here in the audience, by, by the appreciation you've just showed, uh, the, the, the game owes him... Um, a great deal of thanks because I think around the time that we really wanted to launch it into professionalism, Jonah was the catalyst for doing that. Mm. Uh, and I think his efforts at the, the 95 World Cup in particular, the, the, the scope that his profile reached all over the world was incredible. Uh, I remember being in a, in a uh, discotheque, you know those, in, in <laughs> France? Do you know what they are? The disco like. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's what they are. <laughs> Late at night and uh, after the test match and we're having a few drinks and uh, a group of security guards came up around us all dressed in black and black and white, you know, with the black ties actually looked like us to be fair. Um, and uh, we were being rowdy but not too, too loud by all black standards. Um, and we're, we're we weren't being inappropriate but just having a good time and they stood all around us and they sort of uh, aggressively sort of stepped forward, so obviously it was the bouncers. Uh, at that stage, Richard Lowe stood up because he thought there was going to be a fight and he was looking forward to that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which forwards tend to do. Um, Andrew Merton's hid under the coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of them stepped forward and Richard Lowe, you know, stepped forward and they were basically face to face and a couple of the other forwards got up and I joined Merts under the table. <laughs> uh, and uh, the guy said, look, gentlemen, and it was like, here we go, this is going to kick off. Discotheque in Paris is not going to go down well in the media. Uh, said, Hi, really, the guy said, look, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we were just wondering, Mr. Lomu, if you could go and get a photo with uh, the lady we worked for over there, Miss Mariah Carey. <laughs> and uh, at which stage, Mertz jumped out from under the table. I'm Jonah! <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Look, my point is, like, how on earth, you know, does someone like Mariah Carey know who Jonah Lomu is, what, even rugby? And I think that's how he, he, he promoted and, and, and put the game to where it needed to go, go globally for us all to have had a future in the game and, and be lucky to be pros. Mm. You must have seen him do phenomenal things. Paul, come in, sorry, yeah. No, uh, it's nothing to do with Jonah Lomu, but I'm just remembering... Discotech. Dis no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you were, Brian will remember, we, we were in a senior players meeting and uh, uh, rugby, you know, Ireland were beginning to be successful and rugby was taking off and uh, <laughs> Brian suggested in a senior players meeting that uh, <laughs> it was now high time that we needed security on nights out. <laughs> 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 which, which, uh, which they duly obliged and got for us, to which we <laughs> thought we can do what we like now and like now. And if Twitter had been around, or Facebook, or Instagram had been around on that first night out when we had security, we'd all be in jail. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. On that beautiful note, um, <laughs> the lads are going to be back. We're going to take a short break. Uh, I have to do a few quick bits and bobs of housekeeping, but will you give a uh, warm round of applause, please? Uh, Justin Marshall here, everyone. Brilliant. <laughs>